out. Then they pulled the plugs on the incoming phone lines. The confusion mounted when newsmen tapped their private sources and learned that a B-47 had been sent into the area. A few days later, the Air Force told the Kansans what they'd seen. The reflection from burning waste gas torches in a local oil field. This was greeted with the Kansan version of the Bronx cheer. 1956 was a big year for Project Blue Book. According to an old friend, Captain George Gregory, who was then chief of Blue Book, they received 778 reports. And through a lot of sleepless nights, they were able to solve 97.8% of them. Only 17 remained unknowns. Digging through the reports for 1956, outside of the ones already mentioned, there were few real good ones. In Banning, California, Ground Observer Corps spotters watched a balloon-like object make three rectangular circuits around the town. In Plymouth, New Hampshire, two GOC spotters reported a bright yellow object which left a trail similar to a jet moving slowly at a very high altitude. At Rosebury, Oregon, state police received many reports of funny green and red lights moving slowly around a television transmitter tower. And in Hartford, Connecticut, two amateur astronomers looking at Saturn through a four-inch telescope were distracted by a bright light. Turning their telescopes on it, they observed a large whitish-yellow light shaped like a 10-gallon hat. Many other people evidently saw the same UFO because the local newspaper said, reports have been pouring in. In Miami, a Pan American Airlines radar operator tracked a UFO at speeds up to 4,000 miles an hour. Five of his skeptical fellow radar operators watched and were confirmed. At Moneymore, Northern Ireland, a level-headed and God-fearing citizen and his wife captured an 18-inch saucer by putting a headlock on it. They started to the local police station, but put the saucer down to climb over a hedge and it went whirling off to the hinterlands of space. The 27th Air Defense Division that guards the vast aircraft and missile centers of Southern California was alerted on the night of September 9th. In rapid succession, a Western Airlines pilot making an approach to Los Angeles International Airport, the Ground Observer Corps, and numerous Los Angeles citizens called in a white light moving slowly across the Los Angeles basin. When the big defense radars on San Clemente Island picked up an unknown target in the same area that the light was being reported, two F-89 jet interceptors were scrambled but saw nothing. A few days later, investigators learned that a $27.65 weather balloon had caused the many thousand dollars worth of excitement. The matter of scrambling interceptors has been a sore point with the UFO business for a long time. Many people believe that the mere fact the Air Force will send up two, three, or even four aircraft that cost $2,000 an hour to fly is proof positive that the Air Force doesn't believe its own story that UFOs don't exist. The official answer you'll get if you ask the Air Force is that they scramble against any unknown target as a matter of defense. But over coffee, you get a different answer. They write the UFO scrambles off as training cost. Each pilot has to get so much flying time, and simulating intercepts against an unidentified light is more interesting than merely burning holes in the air. If appropriations are ever cut to the point where training must be curtailed, and, heaven forbid, there will be no more scrambles after flying saucers. And the colonel who told me this was emphatic. The year 1957 was heralded in by a startling announcement which ended a long dry spell of UFO news. 
at a press conference in Washington, D.C., retired Admiral Delmer S. Farney made a statement. Newspapers across the country carried it complete, or in part, and people read the statement with interest, because Admiral Farney is well known as a sensible and knowledgeable man. He had fought for and built up the Navy's guided missile program back in the days when people who talked of ballistic missiles and satellites had to fight for their beliefs. First, Admiral Farney announced that a non-profit organization, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, NICAP, had been established to investigate UFO reports. He would be chairman of the Board of Governors, and his board would consist of such potent names as retired Vice Admiral R. H. Hillenketter, for two years the director of the super-secret Central Intelligence Agency, retired Lieutenant General P. A. Del, the famous 1st Marine Division, retired Rear Admiral Herbert B. Knowles, noted submariner of World War II. Then Admiral Farney read a statement regarding the policies of NICAP. It was as follows. Reliable reports indicate that there are objects coming into our atmosphere at very high speeds. No agency in this country or Russia is able to duplicate at this time the speeds and accelerations which radars and observers indicate these flying objects are able to achieve. There are signs that an intelligence directs these objects because of the way they fly. The way they change position and formations would indicate that their motion is directed. The Air Force is collecting factual data on which to base an opinion, but time is required to sift and correlate the material. As long as such unidentified objects continue to navigate through the Earth's atmosphere, there is an urgent need to know the facts. Many observers have ceased to report their findings to the Air Force because of the seeming frustration, that is, all information going in and none coming out. It is in this area that NICAP may find its greatest mission. We are in a position to screen independently all UFO information coming in from our filter groups. General Albert C. Wiedemeyer will serve the committee as evaluations advisor and complete analyses will be arranged through leading scientists. After careful evaluation, we shall release our findings to the public. Donald Kehoe, a retired Marine Corps major and author of three top-seller UFO books, was appointed director. The mere fact that another civilian UFO investigative group was being born was neither news nor UFO history because since 1947, well over a hundred such organizations had been formed. Many still exist. Many flock but none deserve the niche in UFO history that does NICAP. NICAP had power and it raised a storm that took months to calm down. NICAP got off to a fast start. Dues were pegged at $7.50 a year, which included a subscription to the very interesting magazine, The UFO Investigator, and the operation went into high gear. With such names as Farney, Wiedemeyer, Hillenketter, Del Valley, and Knowles for prestige, and Keyhoe for intrigue, saucer fans all over the United States packaged up their 750 and mailed it to headquarters. Each, in turn, became a listening post and an investigator. Keyhoe set up a panel of special advisors, all saucer fans, to impartially evaluate the UFO reports ferreted out by the listening posts, based on facts uncovered by the investigators. Even though the leading scientists Farney mentioned in his statement never materialized, NICAP was cocked, primed, and ready. To get things off to a gala start, Kehoe, as director of NICAP, wrote to the Air Force and set out NICAP's eight-point plan. In essence, this plan suggested, some say demanded, 
that the Air Force let NICAP ride herd on Project Blue Book. First of all, NICAP wanted its panel of special advisors to review and concur with all of the conclusions on the thousands of UFO reports that the Air Force had in its files. This went over like a worm in the punch bowl. First of all, the Air Force didn't feel it was necessary to review its files. Secondly, they knew NICAP. If every balloon, planet, airplane, and bird that caused a UFO report hadn't been captured and a signed confession rung out, the UFO would be a visitor from outer space. The Air Force decided to ignore NICAP. But NICAP wouldn't be ignored. They bombarded everyone from the Secretary of the Air Force on down with telephone calls, telegrams, and letters. Still, the Air Force remained silent. Then NICAP headquarters called in the troops, and members from all corners of the nation cut loose. The barrage of mail broke the logjam, and just enough information to constitute an answer dribbled out of the office of the Secretary of the Air Force. But this didn't satisfy Kehoe or his UFO-hungry Nicapions. They wanted blood, and that blood had to taste like spaceships or they wouldn't be happy. The cudgel they picked up next was powerful. The Air Force had said that there was nothing classified about Project Blue Book, yet NICAP hadn't seen every blessed scrap of paper in the Air Force UFO files. This was unwarranted censorship. While Congress was right in the middle of such important and crucial problems as foreign policy, atomic disarmament, racketeering, integration, and a dozen and one other problems, NICAP began to bedevil every senator and representative who was polite enough to listen. It's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease, and in November 1957, the United States Senate Committee on Government Operations began an inquiry concerning UFOs. I gave my testimony, and so did others who had been associated with Project Blue Book. A few weeks later, the inquiry was dropped. But NICAP had made its name. Of all of the thorns that have been pounded into the UFO side of the Air Force, NICAP drove theirs the deepest. In the midst of all this mess, Admiral Farney, General Wedemeyer, and General DeValley, politely and quietly, resigned from NICAP's Board of Governors. Neither the loss of these famous names stopped NICAP. They continue to forge ahead, undaunted. In many UFO incidents, they have actually uncovered additional and sometimes interesting information. NICAP Director Don Kehoe has taken a beating, being accused of profiteering, trying to make headlines, and other minor social crimes. But personally, I doubt this. Kehoe is simply convinced that UFOs are from outer space, and he's a dedicated man. While the big NICAP Air Force battle was going on, the UFOs were not waiting to see who won. They were still flying. At Ellington Air Force Base, Texas, a Ground Observer Corps team spotted a UFO and passed it on to a radar crew. Although the radar crew couldn't pick it up on their sets, they saw it visually. The lieutenant in charge told investigators how it 